Okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to LitFest at Bard College Berlin. I am Martin Littmann. I teach in the German Studies program, and I will be a host for tonight's event. Um, this is the second night out of three. We had a sort of soft opening of the festival last Thursday with a talk and reading by poet and translator Alistair Noon, who happens to be here tonight. <laughs> um, but tonight is the first one in this particular setting at our um, W15 cafe. Um, the idea of having a literary festival at Bard College Berlin is older than the pandemic. Um, <laughs> but like so many other endeavors, it had to wait um, until live events were back because the prospect of a literary event was the original incentive for the festival. Now, luckily, one should say, Berlin already has a thriving literary scene. It would be possible to find a literary reading somewhere in Berlin every night. Um, however, the plentitude of offerings um, that there are and the events is not exactly evenly distributed among all the districts um, and areas of Berlin and parts of the city. So for those of us who live in Pankow, um, going to see a reading usually means going from Essen U-Bahn Station, um, Bahnhof Pankow, into the city, not in the other direction. And sometimes that means not going at all. Um, this is not to say that Pankow is a literary wasteland. On the contrary, um, one could point to Pankow's tradition, perhaps not exactly as a writer's colony, but certainly as an area of Berlin in which writers settled, especially after 1945. So if you walk around the area, you can find plaques commemorating writers such as Hans Fallada, Stefan Hermlin, or Christa Wolf. Um, several eminent contemporary writers also um, reside in the neighborhood, and at least one of them is with us tonight. I'm not talking about myself here. <laughs> um, however, when it comes to public events, um, we felt that there is still room for more. That is, it is still possible to make meaningful offers um, to the neighborhood without oversaturating the market. Um, and Bart College Berlin seemed to be the right place for trying this. Um, it is a space where the community is engaged in learning and creative practices every day. Um, tonight's and tomorrow's events open up this space to the public. The topic of the first edition of the LitFest at Bar College Berlin is writing between languages, and it was chosen to reflect the post-monolingual condition that characterizes all activities at Bar College Berlin, especially writing, whether it is the writing of emails, writing of exams, writing of term papers, essays, fiction, journalism, or academic articles and monographs. And it is a condition that increasingly shapes the Berlin literary scene as well. So LitFest at Bar College Berlin is meant to engage with that scene and to foster exchange um, about contemporary writing in a multitude of languages. I would like to thank everyone who helped to make it possible, the communications office at Bar College Berlin, Sabrina Jagumin, who helped with the proposal, Chelsea, who did publicity, and Charlie is also here tonight and who created the amazing poster. Our site manager, Lars Kruder, who helps with the seating arrangement and the chairs, Abdullah and Elena behind the camera, and the Deutsche Literaturfonds, who is funding tonight's and tomorrow's reading through the Neustadt Kulturprogramm, and last but not least, our students in whose curiosity trusted. Tonight's event is built as two kinds of Alaska. Now, I have never been to Alaska myself, but I can recall the conversation 
with a person who was born and raised uh, in Alaska. And that, that was in Moscow, Idaho, some six or seven years ago um, at an academic conference on eco-criticism. And I was at a pizza place and it turned out that the pizza baker was from Alaska and while we were sitting outside in the yard and waiting for our pizza, he actually came out and said, um, actually, we're not allowed to, to serve alcohol here, but if you want to go to the corner store at 7-Eleven and grab your own beer, I'm fine with that. And I think this is the right approach towards this bar. So this is what we did. We brought some beer of our own. Um, please stay with us um, after the reading and enjoy some of it. Um, an American writer who lives in Berlin and whose new book is set in Alaska. So far you wouldn't be able to tell which of our two guests I'm <laughs> speaking about because it is a description that matches both of them. Um, Isabel Fargo Coe and Rebecca Rutheiser. Luckily, you are by no means the same, um, but you are both unique. Um, Rebecca, you were born in California, California Davis, um, which is a few hours drive from San Francisco. Um, you are a graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and you teach creative writing, and you have taught, of all places, uh, at Art College Berlin. You received a work stipend from the Berlin Senate for literature, um, a non-German literature. Um, your work was included in Best American Non-Required Reading, an anthology. Um, and the seaplane on final approach, which came out this summer, is your first book. Um, is it appropriate to say that you fell in love with Berlin and in Berlin? Yes. Both of those are appropriate to say. <laughs> um, I'm glad to hear that. Um, Isabel, you offer a few biographical cues in um, the book that you will be reading from tonight. Um, one sentence goes, 1973 kam ich zwischen den beiden Küsten in Illinois zur Welt. So you were born between the two coasts um, in Illinois. Um, 20 pages on, you state, 1984 zogen wir nach New York City. 1984, we moved to New York City. You studied literature, um, philosophy and history at the University of Chicago. You also mentioned your Umsiedlung nach Berlin, 1995. You're relocating to Berlin in 1959, 1995. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, to study Russian and German uh, literature at Humboldt University. Um, and one could add that you are a Pankow resident. For how long have you lived in Pankow? 21 years. Mm -hmm. That's longer than Spark College Berlin <laughs> <laughs> has been in the area. Um, you established yourself as a translator from German into English. Um, one German writer that you introduced into the Anglophone uh, book market is Wolfgang Hilbig, um, an important GDR writer of prose and some poetry. Um, your first novel, Die Grüne Grenze, which came out in 2017 is actually set in the GDR in the 1970s. Um, for this first novel, you received a shortlist nomination for the Preis der Leipziger Buchmesse, which is not the worst start one can get with the first novel, I would say. In 2019, followed Das Gift der Biene, um, another novel which is set in Berlin in the 1990s. This tells a story that I think comes from the same source material as the story of the first novel. And Die, Go Die Goldküste, eine Irrfahrt is your third book. This one came out only very recently and the ink has dry, barely dried on the page. It is a Manoir, it is travel writing, nature writing, family history, 
it is as we are about to see many things at once. And we are going to hear you read from your book first, and then we'll hear Rebecca read from hers, and we'll have a conversation about your respective books, and then there will be a Q&A where every one of you can also contribute and ask, and ask questions. Um, Chris, before you start reading, and I know that you are going to read from behind the bar, um, can I ask you what prompted you to write about Alaska? Can you still recall the moment when it became clear that you would be, this would be your next book that you'd be spending years of writing? Well, it's, I, I took a trip, I've only been in Alaska once as a tourist in 2018. My parents celebrated their 50th anniversary by visiting the only one of the 50 states they hadn't had a road trip in yet, So, and they kindly invited me along. Uh, so it was kind of this eco-tourist trip in Denali National Park, and then a small ship kind of wildlife cruise on the Inside Passage in, the, in southern Alaska. And um, I took a very voluminous uh, travel diary because I was so overwhelmed by all the impressions. And, um, and then I kind of, um, yeah, I thought, okay, I'll just work it out for myself. But then I happened to mention, I met the, the editor of this, of this nature writing series, um, and she asked me what I was working on. And I said, with completely, without any uh, ulterior motives, I said, oh, I'm working on this travel diary back in Alaska. And she said, oh, we really want something about the North in our, in our, uh, in our series, and uh, you, should, you should write that up for us. And I said, OK. <laughs> and then she kept bugging me. Um, and, then, and then the lockdown happened. And I had this massive research project that involved a lot of uh, at least mental traveling uh, and it yeah, became uh, more than this travel diary. It was also, um, as, as we'll see, um, I have this family story about my great-great-grandfather, Arva Fargo, who ran off from uh, Livermore, Livermore, California, in the Bay Area to Alaska to look for gold, uh, left the family in the lurch, so his, uh, my great-grandfather never wanted to talk about him. But there was... Uh, Apparently, when my aunt, who taught in Davis, so there are all these weird connections here, uh, looked into the family history, um, she found this newspaper article claiming that he actually did find gold. So I, of course, wanted to look into that, and that was my opportunity. So that was what Corona gave me. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we're going to hear, to hear a first section from that book. So this uh, first passage um, I'm going to read is, um, we are staying in um, little cabins in um, Denali National Park. I think some of you might have heard of Denali. It's the tallest mountain in North America. It used to be called Mount McKinley until Obama officially restored its Native American name, Denali. And it's this, um, yeah, 6,000 meter peak. So you have these mountains in front of it that are as high as the Alps, and then you have this huge white mountain on top of that, and that was the view from the cabin. Zweiter Juli. Um halb zehn, als ich in meiner Ferienhütte schlafen ging, stand die ganze Kuppel strahlend weiß vom tiefblauen Himmel. Sie war genauso hell und klar, als ich um zwei Uhr wieder aufwachte und um fünf, als ich aufstand. 3. Juli 2018 Camp Denali liegt auf einer Anhöhe, Ausläufer der Kentishna Hills, die vom Norden her zur Outer Range stoßen. Dunkelrote Hütten stehen im Hang zwischen Gesträuch und kleinen Fichten. Eine Schotterstraße führt hinauf zur Lodge, ein giebelüberdachter Saal mit Panoramafenstern. Meine eigene Hütte hatte ein schmales Bett mit einer Flickendecke, eine Gaslampe als Leselicht. Der sanfte Knall bei einem Zünden des Glühstrunks, der Geruch und das leise Zischen des Benzins erinnerten an die Coleman-Laterne der Eltern auf dem Picknicktisch beim Zelten und an die Motten, die, die gegen das Glas prallten, so viele Insekten damals. Zum Heizen ein Kamin, am Fenster ein Holzgestell mit Gaskochfeld und Abflussbecken, 
einem Fach mit Kaffee, Tee, Geschirr. Ein Teekessel, ein roter Emaillekrug, um Wasser vom Hahn vor der Tür zu holen. Hinter dem Hahn, zwischen zwei Fischen, der Denali. Der große Traum. Einschlafen und als Thoreau aufwachen. Die Hütte ist schon fertig, als hätte ich sie selbst gebaut. Als Kind aus Möbelstücken oder Ästen. Alles, was im Wald wächst, hat eine Verbindung und ich weiß Bescheid. Als Kind, als Vorform Thoreaus, kam ich ohne Geld und Rechnen aus. Der erwachsene Henry David rechnete vor. Der Bau seiner Hütte hatte ihn nur 28 Dollar und 12 Cent gekostet. Als ich ihn zum ersten Mal las, fand ich ihn unerträglich selbstgefällig. Self-reliant, herabschauend auf handwerklich Unbegabte. Oder, wie die Pascal Zitierenden des Lockdowns, auf Menschen, die es in der Isolation nicht aushalten. Später verstand ich, dass er sich selbst damit Mut macht. Es ist ein Feigen im Walde. Das überbordende Ego gehört einem Mann, der für die Schublade schreibt. So konnte er andere, anderen nach ihm Mut machen. Ob Richard Krennicki Walden schon vorher kannte oder erst nachdem er selbst als moderner Thoreau galt. Krennicki wurde 1916 in Iowa geboren, war also so alt wie mein Oma Fargo. Im Zweiten Weltkrieg war er Schiffszimmerer, danach Mechaniker, zuletzt für den Fish and Wildlife Service in Alaska. 1968 zog er in einen Bergsee, 225 Kilometer westlich von Anchorage, lebte 30 Jahre lang allein in seiner Blockhütte, filmte und führte Tagebuch. Aus seinen Notizen wurde 1973 das Buch One Man's Wilderness, das ihn bekannt machte. Manchmal zog es Neugierige zu seiner Hütte, wo sie einen fremdfreundlichen Menschen antrafen, denn zu seinen Lebzeiten überstieg sein Ruhm nicht das für ihn erträgliche Maß. Mit 82 Jahren zog er zu seinem Bruder nach Kalifornien, mit 86 starb er. Seine Hütte vermachte er dem National Park Service. Sie zieht immer mehr Abenteuertouristen an, seit der Dokumentarfilm Alone in the Wilderness 2004 aus seinen Aufnahmen entstand. Seine Analogfilme sind Artefakte. Die Lebensweise, die er vorführt, war es bereits 1968. Ein Artefakt ist das, was überlebt, dessen Nutzen, wenn auch nicht leicht erzifferbar, so doch greifbar ist. Auf mich wirken Prennickys Bilder vertraut, die nüchterne Helle des 60er-Jahre-Films. Wie in einem Film aus meiner Kindheit, war in seiner 1969, über einen in Thoreau verladen Jungen der von zu Hause wegläuft und sich in einem hohen Baum im Gebirge einrichtet. Der Wald war wie der Wald bei Ithaca, wo ich meine Kindheit verbrachte. Die, die Handlung für Walter bei praktischen Details blieb in Erinnerung als eine Anleitung, auf die ich zurückgreifen könnte, sollte es mich eines Tages in die Wildnis verschlagen. Frenicky geht es allein um die Anleitung, er hat nicht den Anspruch, eine Geschichte zu erzählen. Seine Kamera nimmt alles auf. Berge, See, Wetter, Tiere, ihn selbst, wie er seine Hütte, Werkzeuge und häuslichen Gerätschaften aus den Stoffen der Landschaft, Bäume, Kies, Moos, zusammenbaut. Er setzt sich nur rudimentär in Szene, wo er das Nötigste, um sein Tun festzuhalten. Sein Tun hält er fest, weil es nötig ist, aus demselben Grund, weshalb du Tango führst, um überhaupt erst zu verstehen, was du denkst du tust. Durchaus mit den Hintergedanken, dies könnte irgendwem irgendwann nützlich sein. Irgendwer, irgendwann. Eine andere Öffentlichkeit als das jeder jetzt des Netzes. Er wendet sich an eine Kamera, die Auge mit Beinen für ihn selbst steht oder für einen Freund oder ein Kind, das sich heranpirscht. Er hatte keine Kinder. Ein paar imaginäre Gegenüber, ein Spiel mit dem eigenen Bewusstsein, mit den wenigen Menschen, die ein Bewusstsein überhaupt erfassen kann. Kein Massenpublikum versammelt sich für der Landschaft. Aber wie schon Thoreau lebt Frenicky in einem Widerspruch. Wie ein Goldsucher zieht der andere Goldsucher nach sich. Will er letztlich doch Gesellschaft? Oder glaubt er, dass die Einsamkeit für alle reicht? Im einsamen Tod des Chris McCandless verschärften sich die Widersprüche. Er wurde zum Stoff eines Buches, eines Films. Immer mehr Menschen brachten nach Hiwi auf pilgerten auf dem alten Snow Key Trail zum Bus, in dem McCandless starb, 
von der inzwischen zum Schreit geworden war. Immer wieder gerieten sie dabei in Todesgefahr. Manche konnten von der Nationalgarde gerettet werden, manche ertranken, weil sie die Strömung des Teklanikers unterschätzt hatten. Erbittet wurde darüber gestritten, ob McHenfris ein tragischer Held oder nur ein Idiot gewesen war, der andere Idioten mit ins Verderben stürzte. Vieles hing dabei an einer technischen Frage. War ihm die Nahrungssuche nicht gelungen oder hatte er sich vielmehr eine seltene pflanzliche Vergiftung zugezogen? Kurzum, war ihm mit seinem Tod ein Anfängerfehler unterlaufen oder war er an eine Übung von Fortgeschritten gescheitert? Derweil roberten die Fotos der Pilger im Netz. Neue Pilger brachen zum Schreien auf. Und wenn sie starben, pilgerten ihre Angehörigen ebenfalls zu Bus und hinterließen neue Gedenkschreine. Um der Geschichte ein Ende zu setzen, entfernte die Nationalgarde im Juni noch 2020 den Bus mit einem Hubschrauber und brachte ihn an einen sicheren Ort. Sommer 2020. Blütezeit des Kernenforn. Wer das Glück hat, den Lockdown in einer eigenen Wildnishütte zu verbringen, kann mit Bildern aufwarten, die anderen dabei helfen, sich Aktionen einzurichten. Chris McCampus lebte als bewusster Anachronist und starb als unbewusste Vorbote. Eine, eine einst alltägliche Art zu sterben, das Verhungern in der Wildnis, gilt bei ihm als Tragödie, als außergewöhnliches mahnendes Ereignis. Die Botschaft seiner Tagebücher, was ist aus dem Blut geraten, traf den Nerv der Zeit. Die Nachricht von seinem Tod löste eine Lawine aus. Es war die Anfangszeit des Internets, jenes Massenversuchs zu Beweis einer Binsenweisheit. Die Gedanken springen dorthin, wo der Körper nicht hinkommt. Du liest die Aufzeichnung eines Trecks, eines Überwinterns im Gebirge und glaubst gedanklich, also auch körperlich folgen zu können. Der schriftliche Bericht kann immerhin den Widerstand des Terrains spürbar machen. Anders die Fotos, die seit 1992 wie von Selbstbuchern, Bilder, unzugängliche Orte auf Schritt und Tritt mitgeteilt. Ihr Richter blocken ins Bodenlose des Realen. Der Name des Stampede Trail enthält eine Warnung. Er stammt vom Goldrausch, der 1905 in den Kentischner Hills losbrach, nachher größere Räusche am Yukon. Für den Massenansturm auf immer abgelegenere Gegenden hatte sich das Wort Stampede eingebürgert, eine Viehherde, die durchdreht. Die Stampeder nannten sich selbst so, bekannten sich trotzig zum, zum kopflosen Glückssuche. So, jetzt lese ich ein, ein Gedicht äh, von meinem Urgroßvater, der, ähm, der, der an die Lokalzeitung äh, Livermore Hill äh, geschickt hatte. Das beschreibt seine Überfahrt noch einmal. I'm going to read this in English because it would be silly to read it in German for this audience. Livermore Herald, June 16, 1900. On the way to Nome, A. A. Fargo. 180, 180 miners bold left San Francisco in search of gold. Rash deeds had they done, but none were rasher than when they boarded the steamer Thrasher. <laughs> I'm skipping a few stanzas that describe the very stormy, uh, stormy passage. My friends, these miners bold are we, and still we sail the deep blue sea. But never despair, for our captain brave is doing his best at his word he gave to leave unturned no stick nor stone to land us first on the beach at Nome. So let us try and make Dutch harbor. Then ho for a bat the feet and a barber, then we'll sail again for the promised land, and buck the ice to beat the band, and prove to our friends who left at home that the Thrasher Union got first to know. Den Ton des Gedichtes hatte ich noch im Ohr. Die Lust, es jetzt nachzulesen, war mir vergangen. Aber genau das hatte ich mir vorgestellt. Für morgens in meiner Hütte das Notebook aufklappen und die Klondike News aufrufen, als könnte ich mein eigenes Claim in der Landschaft vor meinem Fenster abstecken. Abwegiger Gedanke. Im Fenster stand das weiße Massiv. Keine starre Kuppel, sondern eine belegte Form, für die ich kein richtiges Wort fand. Ein ruhendes Tier, wirklich schon mal, bildet seine Flanke. Eine Schulter wölbt sich, Kraft laut und knickt des Ellbogens, der Vorderlauf ist ausgestreckt. Pioneer Ridge, ein Grad, der in die Reihe der 3000er übergeht 
und so das Tierbild auflöst. Eine Baumperle, eine Rokaille. Ein Muschelhorn hört sich von der eingebundenen Spitze oder ein weißes Tuch, linke Hand dicht ab, baut sich im Wind auf. Den Berg hat Aaron nicht gesehen und wenn, dann hätte er sich wohl nicht lange mit der Beschreibung aufgehalten. Er war kein Thoreau, nicht einmal ein Bekenntnis. Von ihm war ein einziges Gedicht überliefert, geschrieben in Dutch Harbor auf Unalaska in den Alleguten. Vielleicht mit Blick auf die russische Kirche, weiß, weiß rot und zwiebeltürmisch zwischen bleiernem Meer und wurden steil hängenden Nebel in den weißen Nächten. Was hielt Arbeit davon fest? Bad, Essen und Friseur. Das Meer und die Berge waren nur die Kulisse der Kühnheitsgeste an die daheim gebliebenen gerichtet. So wie sie an mich gerichtet. Aber verspottete meinen Nature-Riding-Ehrgeiz. Die Ur-Ur-Enkelin, die in der Betrachtung des Berges aufgehen will, belächelte der tapfere Schöpfer. Er hatte sich unter Strapazen ein richtiges, handfestes Pflege erhoben. Nichts, worauf ich Anspruch erheben konnte. Dafür war er mit mir zu fern, ein Fremder, der mir nichts vererbt hatte. Vielmehr hatte er mir etwas weggenommen, meine Erbschaft verprasst. <lacht> All right. Um, so, just in case anyone has been confused, this was not a translation. This was the book that you wrote in German. Um, as you did with your previous literary books. And you, mel you mentioned elsewhere that what that it was actually the subject matter that specifically um, drew you to writing in German because you realized that when you were writing stories that dealt with GDR related matters, these were topics that your contemporary peers who were writing in, in English could not relate to in the same way that, that German writers or, or um, the German audience, so that that made you change languages initially. Um, so I've been wondering, how did Alaska lend itself to the German language? It, it was harder. I mean, with my other books, it was not so much about the audience, it was just that this uh, I was very immersed in the subject matter, and it was, it was like I was having to translate you know, words like Wende or, or, you know, just ideas into into English and, um, and writing the Alaska book, I was doing a lot of research and dealing with a lot of um, materials that were in English and I, I find it harder to translate in the other direction um, and it was, um, it, it was a bit harder to kind of make that leap into German again, but it was also interesting because I think working in German gave me maybe a bit more distance to the, um, I mean, Alaska is like, you know, Alaska is not familiar to me anyway. It's very different from the rest of the United States in many ways. Um, and, um, and when I go back to the United States, I, I often feel like, you know, an anthropologist from Mars. Uh, so I, I have that distance anyway, but I think it was, it was interesting to write about the U.S. in, in, in German and, uh, yeah, make, make me think about it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Now, a specifically German concept is that of the Sachbuch, and the students in my the Writing Life class may remember that when we visited the Berenberg Verlag recently, we learned that there was actually one person who allegedly coined that phrase, um, a journalist for the FAZ, who, as we've been told, regretted um, this um, coinage for the rest of his days. Um, still, it is in the world, and um, the weekly newspaper, the Zeit, has called the Goldküste, uh, quote, eines der schönsten Sachbücher des Jahres. Um, as you can immediately see, it is schön as an object. It is beautifully made. It is beautiful as a work of writing as well. And just two days ago, your friend and colleague Judith Chalansky at the book launch event took um, 
issue with this category. And I have to say, I felt the same impulse when I first read the review, but then I thought it's maybe it's just a way of saying that the only thing that this book is not is a work of fiction, and of all the books that fall under this category of not being a work of fiction, um, this fall, this one stands out. But still, on your website, you um, introduce the book as an essay, um, and to me, that makes sense because it acknowledges the literariness of the form. I think this book cannot be reduced to being just informative. It has a literary form. I, I'm not picky, as long as they don't call it a novel, which is, <laughs> and, and I'm serious, there are a lot of, I notice a lot of times people's memoirs or essays will get called novels by mm -hmm. publishers because they think that will help it sell more copies, so, um, yeah, I, I'm not that picky about it, I guess Zaku kind of sounds maybe more scholarly or, uh, I, I, I like the word essay, I think anything can be an essay, and um, it, it means that it's kind of a freer form and it's, um, it's not like an exhaustive history of Alaska or uh, it's, it's not just totally objective, but I, yeah, I, I, I don't have an issue with, with Zaku, at least. Um, it makes it clear that it's um, not a fiction story. Mm -hmm. um, as we have seen or heard from the passage that you, you just read, um, this this essay um, has many or multiple layers. There is the account of the actual trip that you took in 2018 with dates. Um, this one strand of the of the narrative in the book. Another one is the story of the actual writing process during the lockdown, um, 2020 onwards, and of your research. Um, and the third one is Arba's story, your great grandfather. Um, this story is embedded within the larger history of the Alaska Gold Rush around 1900. And woven into these stories again are excursions into botany, geology, indigenous culture and practices, and Entdeckungsreisen, missions of discovery. So I was wondering what the actual writing process did, did look like. Did you work with an outline, or was it more spread out like a tapestry that you put the many bits at once and then assembled well, was a, The basis was this, um, was this travel journal, uh, this journal, and uh, so there were some ideas or things that I was curious about along a uh, route like this uh, this character, Richard Prennicky, that I talk about, uh, that was when we were in this bus uh, that drove us up to Denali National Park, the bus driver just put this video on because it was a six hour bus ride, and, and this video was this guy, Richard Prennicky, who uh, um, just went off and lived in his head for, for 30 years and became this kind of cult figure. And so I had this figure of of this Richard Prennicky in my mind from those that day of the trip, and I was of course thinking about him there when we, you know, I was sitting in my little glamping hut in, in the park, and and you know afterwards I kind of looked into him, and then I thought, okay, and that kind of fits in with uh, with uh, Henry Thoreau with his hut, and uh, just this idea of different people trying to um, you know be Aussteiger, what do we say in English? Uh, you know, get away from it all and um, drop out of society and uh, in Alaska is a place that will be, uh, draws people like that. And so that kind of turned into this riff that I just read about different, or this Chris, Christopher McCandless that I think people might know from this movie, Into the Wild, was the same man who went out to Alaska and uh, into the wild and, and died there and left a diary that became kind of a cult book. So I was kind of, um, just because of the things that I happened to be encountering on that part of the trip, I, they kind of fit together in this interesting way to, for me to think about um, what kind of people go off into the wilderness and how do they write about it and how do people uh, think about people like that and uh, kind of read their books and think, oh yes, you know, I can imagine I'm reading Chris McCandless's diary and I imagine being out in the wilderness and um, so that it, a lot of things just kind of fell 
into place for me because of the just the, the place that I was at in that part of the, <coughs> the diary. And then there were some things that I just wanted to figure out, like the whole background of the gold rushes and what the economics of them were and what the historical background of that was. And, uh, but the, this trip was kind of this, the skeleton of the, the framework of the book. How, how important was the dialogue with these, with these men? You mentioned Henry David Thoreau's, or just very briefly was this um, 19th century American transcendentalist who, um, for actually two years of his life, lived in a cabin by Walden Pond, wrote an account of it, a Walden Hall for life in the woods, and you also mentioned that he was um, actually encouraging, trying to encourage himself because he was writing for the draw, for the, for the Schublade. Um, his, his book, Walden, or Life in the Wood, was not an instant bestseller, one can say. Um, and at some point, when his publisher shipped back the spare copies or surplus copies of the first edition to, to Concord, where he lived, um, he lived, um, Thoreau noted in his diary that he was now the proud owner of a library that contained circa 1,000 volumes, most of which he had written himself. Um, I can so, identify so, with that. <laughs> I can identify with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but, but he, he grew in, in stature, stature nowadays. Um, he's, he's certainly uh, quite a prominent figure. And one thing he, he also did, and one thing that your book also engages with, is that act of performing wilderness. So, it has been argued that for Thoreau, it was not just about trying this out for himself, but for putting himself on display, for people to witness this act of going out of civilization and, and living um, self-reliantly in nature. Well, if every time you write a book, you're doing that. I mean, <laughs> of course, if he was writing it for the drawer, you know, he, he wasn't. I think he was. He was trying to. Um, he was, he was trying to kind of create a utopia in a sense, and so it was it was a bit performative. Apparently, his mother was still doing his laundry, so <laughs> it wasn't totally out in the wilderness. Um, but um, yeah, and as I say, it's like he kind of seems a bit self congratulatory, you know. Oh, I, my my hut only cost twenty eight dollars. You know, why isn't everyone doing this? Um, but um, yeah, I mean, anything anyone writes there. You know, constructing something or performing something, or, yeah, it's, it's legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, you also mentioned that you wouldn't um, place your great grandfather Arva into that line of men like Thoreau, Chronicler, and um, like Canvas, because his motivation to run off to the, the Klondike to, to leave civilization, or to, to go out there, uh, was actually a different one. Yeah, I mean, I for all I knew, he was writing lots of poetry there. I mean, we just, nothing of his came down to us except for one photo. Uh, but I, I assume that, uh, I, I think he just went there for economic reasons and not even for adventure, because um, what I hadn't known before researching the book was that in 1893, there was a massive financial crisis in the U.S., and um, a lot of people lost their work, they lost their savings, uh, there was a lot of unrest, um, and so when these the gold rush began in 1898, a lot of people went to look for gold. They weren't necessarily adventurers, they just uh, had economic problems and were desperate, and I think that was, in, in his case, I found out that he also had some, some um, some economic problems, and I kind of think that he just, yeah, went up there to try to kind of, you know, make make it good. But he wasn't, uh, and he, I think he had a sense of adventure, as you can tell from his poem. But um, I, I, I think it wasn't really from some kind of romantic um, motivation. And I don't think he was necessarily enjoying the scenery a lot <laughs> on the tundra. So did you did you ever consider telling Arva's story as a novel? I. I sort of thought about it abstractly, but it's just too remote, and the time is too remote for me. I mean, I, I find it easier to write about East Germany, because I just have lots of friends from East Germany, and I've spent several decades hearing all about East Germany, so... Uh, but, like, the 1890s in the U.S., um, 
it's like a, another planet, even though a lot of things are very similar to, you know, it's called the Gilded Age. There is a lot of economic inequality and there are rich robber barons, and so there are a lot of things that are like today, but still, um, it's very far away in many ways. Good. Take the second reading passage for us. Yeah. Tonight. Maybe this is, would be a good point to actually hear a bit more from. So I, I picked this to kind of in part to segue to the scheme of sleaze that, uh, <laughs> that Rebecca is going to get into. Um, so this is a kind of a later part of the trip on this uh, cruise in the, uh, the can handle of the inside passage um, of Alaska, which is kind of this maze of fjords and, and islands and, um, and channels. Landformen aufdröseln, 800 Kilometer Berge zwischen Anchorage und Ketchikan. In Kurzstrecken, ach so, Entschuldigung, sorry, I didn't want to read that part, I started later. Festland, Langzungen, Insel, Inselzungen. Entlang Meeresarmen muss ich mit den Finger fahren, will ich Sackgassen und Verbindungsgegen unterscheiden. Ketchikan liegt am Südzipfel des Alexander Archipelago, an der Revier Gegedo Island, die nur eine schmale Wasserstraße von der Festlandküste trennt. Senkte sich der Meeresspiegel, würde sie zur Halbinsel, ihre Fjorde, zu sehen. Stieg er an, schlüssen sich Seen dem Meer an, würden sie Fjorden, Fjorde würden zu Wasserstraßen. Ein Relief, ein Relief wie ein Gehirn, Windungen, Speichergeschichten. Aus Ortsnamen spuren sich Verkettungen dahergelaufener Geschlechter. Ketchikans Flughafen liegt auf der kleinen Gravina Island. Gravina in der Pumien war Nebensitz einer nomadischen Adelsfamilie, die zum Fürstenhaus Siziliens aufstieg. Als deren Spruss Admiral Federico Carlos Gravina Napoli 1805 die spanische Flotte bei Trafalgar befehligte, war er bereits auf Alaskas Küste verewigt. Den Namen Zeugnis der letzten spanischen Erkundungsfahrt in Russisch-Amerika hatte George Vancouver in seiner Karte übernommen. Die große Nachbarinsel taufte er nach dem Vizekönig Neuspaniens Juan Vicente de Goemes Pacheco de Padilla y Rocasitas Graf von Revilla Gegedo. Eine diplomatische Geste, denn Vancouver hatte die Landkarte auch politisch zu klären. Spanien, England, Russland auf fremden Boden berührten sich drei Reiche. Als Babo 1513 in die Brandung am Golf von Panama hineingeschritten war, um das Salz des Weltmeeres zu schmecken, hatte er das ganze Mal der Süd, den Pazifischen Ozean, für den spanischen König in Besitz genommen. Aber die Spanier hatten sich das Südmeer kleiner vorgestellt. Ein überschaubarer Golf, ein Katzensprung nach Indien. Schon bald gaben sie die Erforschung dessen nördlicher Weiten auf. Bereits die kalifornische Küste mit deren Felsen, widrigen Strömungen und mangelnden Häfen hatte sie abgewiesen. Nur Spanien festigte sich im Binnenland um die Landbrücke Zentralamerikas mit Vorposten katholischer Missionare im Südwesten der heutigen USA. Erst russische und britische Vorstöße sporten die Spanier an, die Küste bis nach Alaska zu erkunden. Als sie 1789 den Mut mit einem Fortgesetzten, kam es beinahe zum Krieg mit britischen Händlern, aber Vancouver konnte Verhandlungen einleiten. Spanien, an seine Grenzen gestoßen, zog sich schließlich aus dem Norden zurück. Russland und England teilten den Nordwesten des Kontinents unter sich auf, handelten 1825 die Grenzziehung aus. 1000 Kilometer verläuft sich nur gerade, als 141. Längengrad. Aber im Süden bestanden die Russen auf die Aufsparung des filigranen Pfannenstiels mit ihren Küstensiedlungen, allen voran die Hauptstadt Nova Achanus, heute Sitka. Ein Zahnapfel. Denn die Grenze richtete sich nach dem Teil des noch nicht vermessenen Küstengebirges. Man hatte aufgeteilt, was man weder besaß noch ermessen konnte. In der Tongas Narrows zwischen Gravina Island und Ketchikan laufen die Wege der Entdecker zusammen wie die Strichlinien der Fährverbindungen nach Wrangell, Juno, Prince Rupert oder Metlakantla. Die Flughafenfähre zieht einen Bogen quer durch sie hindurch. 
Um diese 500 Meter zu überspannen, wurde 2004 eine Brücke geplant, fast so nah wie San Francisco's Golden Gate und höher als die Brooklyn Bridge, um die großen Kreuzfahrtschiffe durchzulassen. Als The Bridge to Nowhere ging das Vorhaben durch die Passe und die 50 Bewohner der Grabina Island erschöpften sich. Und sie lebten doch nicht nirgendwo. Sarah Palin befürwortete den Bau der Brücke, als sie 2006 für das Gouverneursamt kandidierte und trug ein T-Shirt mit der Postzeitzahl der Grafen Island und der trotzigen Aufschrift Nowhere Alaska. 2007 sagte sie als Gouverneurin das Brückenprojekt ab. 2008, als John Keynes Vizepräsidentschaftskandidaten, war sie schon immer gegen die Brücke gewesen. I told Congress thanks, but no thanks on that bridge to nowhere. Die Brückenzufahrt allerdings hatte sie durchgewunken. Sonst wären die bewilligten Millionen verfallen. Die einzige Straße auf Gravina Island ist also die 5 Kilometer lange Kiesstrecke vom Flughafen zum nicht vorhandenen Brückenkopf, the Highway to Nowhere. Auch Ketchikan ist nicht nirgendwo. 8000 Einwohner in bunten Holzhäusern an bewaldeten Hängen. Aber die Kreuzfahrtpassagiere sind vermutlich in der Überzahl. Im Zimmer der Cape Fox Lodge war ein fernes Geschrei zu vernehmen. Unten am Hafen lag ein gigantisches Disney-Schiff vor Anker. Ob zur Erlebnisfahrt etwa das Simulieren von Piraten überfällen gehörte? Aber der Lärm stammte von einem log rolling wettbewerb der Great Alaska Lumberjack Show am Hafen. Das weitläufige Holzkonstrukt der Cape Fox Lodge steht auf einem Hügel, stelzengestützt, gewissenhaft. Totenfehler in der Einfahrt, im Atrium ein Schwarzbär. Bei der Decke hängt ein Einbau. Kein Fremd, sondern eine Selbstdarstellung. Die Lodge gehört der Native Co Corporation der hiesigen Klinkit, des hiesigen Klinkit-Stammes, deren Internetfirmenprofil mit der Überquerung der Beringstraße beginnt. Die einst im Süden am Cape Fox ansässigen hatten am Ketchikan Creek ein Sommerlager, als 1894 eine Pockenepidemie Cape Fox Village heimsuchte, siedelte der Stamm endgültig nach Ketchikan um. Von der Lodge führt eine Holztreppe durch den Wald hinab, vorbei an Lachsfeldstauben mit ihren samtig goldenen, goldenen, nach nichts schmeckenden Früchten. Mary Man's Trail heißt der Schleichweg zum alten Rotlichtviertel. Bei Polizeirazien schlüpfen Ehemänner durch die Hintertür der Bordelle an der Creek Street. Die Street ist gleich der Creek. Die spitzgiebigen Bauten säumen das Flüsschen auf Plankenwegen, denn Prostitution war erlaubt solange sie nicht auf dem festen Land stattfand. Während der Prohibitionszeit legten Boote nachts unter den Häusern an, wo der kanadische Whisky durch Fahrtüren gereicht. Die Bretterbuchenreihe auf dem verschachtelten Gerüst zwischen Waldhang und Wasserrauschen wirkt wie eine Vorrichtung zur Verarbeitung von Rohstoffen. Die Kundschaft der Bordelle waren Fischer sowie die Lachskonservenfabrik und Hafenarbeiter. Tafeln gedenken der einzelnen Popmütter. Mit Gesichtern und Geschichten treten die Frauen aus dem Strom der anonymen Männer hervor. Ihre Buntheit fügt sich in die Auslagen der Souvenirläden, die ihre alten Wirkungsstätten okkupieren. Weiblicher Unternehmengeist. Unternehmergeist wird gefeiert. Huren haben die Städte des Festens aufgebaut. Anne Hay Green etwa, die sagen und wohnen der ur 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 oma aus San Francisco deren Enkelin Rachel aber Sohn Elmore heiratete. Als Fassade soll Green einen Pinshop, Stecknadel, Gutnadelladen, betrieben haben, im Obergeschoss befand sich das Bordell. Die Green-Töchter mussten als Verkäuferinnen im Laden arbeiten, bevor sie mit 18 nach oben kamen. Als Rachels Mutter 18 wurde, machte ein Stammkunde ihr einen Heiratsantrag, damit ihr der Berufswechsel erspart blieb. Die Geschichte wie sie Aunt Esther erzählte, lässt die berauschende Gastlichtstimmung vermissen, die Seidenkleide und Westmetaillen, den verstimmten Klavierklang, das kreischende Gelächter, das man von den Festbuchs in alten, in alten Filmen kennt. Bei den Buhlen Ketchikans ging es wohl ähnlich prosaisch zu. Nur im Nachhinein wird alles zum Kitsch. Seltsam begann die lassive amerikanische Brüderie die Prostitution zum bunten Kulturerbe erklärt. Adjektive wie Quaid und Quirky fallen ist. Wie bei Goldrauschmythos werden die dunklen Seiten der Geschichte verniedlicht in der Vitrine aufbewahrt. Aus sicherem Abstand begründet man die goldene Epoche, 
als man sich auch in zu seinen Trieben bekannte, als Rumorei Business as usual war. Business, nach hiesigem kulturellen Maßstab das Natürlichste, was es gibt. Shows this passage because it connects to something we'll speak about later. Um, the idea of the Wild West as a theme park, um, where history is being staged for tourists, and where sex work is retroactively fitted into the image of the of the Wild West. Um, I am interested in um, another aspect of. Um, the book that I feel is, is, is quite present, quite quite strong, um, and it's the, the connection between ecology and poetics. So ecology at its simple, is commonly understood as the principle that everything is connected to everything else. Um, and I think this is shown through examples that are woven into the text, such as um, a paragraph that we have not heard um, about um, connection between the salmon and the forest, and how the salmon that are traveling up the rivers and are eaten by by bears, and the leftovers are taken away um, into the into the woods by bears um, or by birds, or left in the woods by bears, uh, actually become the sort of fertilizer to to make the the trees grow. And without the salmon, the trees would die. And I think on a formal level, um, this is somehow reflected in the kind of entangled storytelling that you are practicing in this text, uh, in this text, it lets in other voices. Yeah, that's definitely, I'm looking for connections or sometimes things like just these, the, like these long Spanish names at the beginning of the passage, just for me, they seem to kind of mirror these, this labyrinth of <coughs> these islands and then um, and they're connected with this history of all of the colonizers and all the different layers of history of all the different countries that uh, explored there and the different cultures that, that overlapped and, and, and conflicted with each other. Uh, so there are these historical interconnections or um, historical and ecological and humans and animals interrelating uh, humans and whales, for instance, uh, uh, interacting uh, to the great detriment of whales. Um, uh, yeah, that's just something that I, I kind of felt that, you know, as I proceeded to find out more about each station of the trip, there were many, there were so many things that interconnected with each other. Mm -hmm. Among the voices that are also present in the book is, is Arba's voice through that poem um, from which we heard excerpts. Um, now in the in this edition of the book, this, this poem is translated into German. It is very much worth reading uh, the German translation as well. It is not your own. It is the translation by a German poet called Nico Bonia. Um, so there's another voice in the book as well. And um, there is also um, a very prominently in, in the epilogue of the book, um, the voice of Adelbert von Chamisso, a French-born botanist and poet who wrote literature in German and who was part of a voyage around the world between 1815 and 1818. And you are quoting in um, that beautiful epilogue, you are quoting from his account of an encounter between the so-called explorers from Europe and the indigenous people um, in which Chamisso reflects on uh, the habsüchtige Neugier, the greedy curiosity that makes Europeans dig up graves of indigenous people and remove the bones um, from these graves. And uh, you also speak about an indigenous village that is gradually eaten up um, by rising sea levels um, caused by climate change. And to me, this epilogue encapsulates a question that is crucial um, to this writing project as I read it, namely, how can we negotiate 
our human desire to explore and the realization that this drive for knowledge can be harmful. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess this was more, more a comment than yeah. a question. I mean, that, you can try, but there's, yeah. I, I don't think there's some formula that you can you do X, Y, and Z and everything will be, no one will ever get hurt or you know, no boundaries will ever be crossed or, you know, it's just, you know. Mm. The American-born novelist um, Jumba Lahiri, who now wrote, writes in Italian, said that the first sentence of a book is a handshake, and your book ends with the image of a hand. And it is a hand that is holding a batch of tundra soil as if offering it up and I would like to use this image to hand it over to Rebecca. <laughs> yes, please. I want some tundra. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, your novel, The Seaplane on Final Approach, is set on Kodiak the Kodiak archipelago in Alaska, where Mira, an 18 year old woman, spends the summer as a seasonal worker at a place called Lavender Island Wilderness Lodge. And she has come there in pursuit of a fisherman called Ed. Yes. Um, Who wears boots very much like Isabel's. <laughs> Um, Ed, whom she has only briefly met during a previous visit to Alaska, um, but she's, she has a mindset on pursuing Ed and marrying Ed. And so she works as a baker and helps performing wilderness for the tourists. During that summer, she witnesses the marriage of her hosts, Stu and Maureen, um, come apart. And I think it's not a spoiler to say that the whole um, adventure doesn't quite play out as planned. This is true. What came first, the setting or the story? Oh, the setting came first. The setting absolutely came first. Um, because I had spent summers working seasonally in Alaska. And um, if you're, uh, as I was a college student in California, um, you learn very quickly that if you want to make good money and have room and board paid for, you can go to Alaska and work in the commercial fishing industry, in canneries. Um, I ended up working also in hospitality. Um, and one of the things that struck me besides just sort of the profound natural beauty of, of Alaska was um, the pressure cooker that is a summer job and the pressure cooker that is a summer job somewhere that's completely isolated. So that, that seemed immediately like, um, you know, a place where sort of novelistic things could potentially happen. That's your first. Yes. All right. From the um, so I'm going to read, this is from early in the novel, um, the protagonist, Mira, has arrived at the Lavender Island Wilderness Lodge, and the first guests are coming in. And her job is sort of like a domestic jack-of-all-trades. She's a baker. Uh, sort of, she's, you know, serving dinner, she's cleaning cabins, all of that. So, the storm moved on and left a week of gray cloud cover. Jan and Co. arrived, their seaplane humming low under the clouds. They unfolded from the seaplane with efficient grace, then helped push the plane back from the beach into the water, before going to the Beer Creek. Side note, in sort of the service of like performing wilderness, 
they've set up this wilderness lodge to have all sorts of amenities, like all the beer is cooled from a fresh mountain stream instead of being like put in the fridge. Hence the beer creek. I walked back in the kitchen, peeling potatoes when they walked past. There were three of them, all tall, all with glossy beards, and they each took a separate cabin. There was something unimaginably wealthy about them and about the luster of their windbreakers, which appeared to be covered in some sort of fine wax or vellum. Maureen knew the type. Norwegians were used to a rugged landscape. They had their own mountains and their own valleys filled with seawater. They were not to be impressed by things like staggering peaks and mentions of how cold the water was. What they wanted was America, the proximity of bears and guns. The Beer Creek was stopped with Coors Light. When I had finished peeling the potatoes, I found Maureen and Chef bent over the week's meal plan, American at top volume. We didn't need to make wild nettles for wild nettle salad. We needed macaroni and cheese, build on the menu as mac and cheese, topped with crumbled potato chips. In all likelihood, the salmon could just as well have been canned. Maureen saw me watching them and said, Mira, wouldn't you like to light some candles? Coziness was not in short supply on Lavender Island. Little things were cozy because they came wrapped in such extremity. There were always candles lit at meal times in the dining room and candles lit in the evenings in the little living room. We didn't need the light. Civil Twilight, the Tide booklet, informed me in a helpful key that broke the degrees the sun had slipped below the horizon into blue gradient squares didn't start until after midnight. But we needed the flame. We needed the smell of burnt matches. We needed to be in the presence of the uh, antique technology of heat and cooking and sustaining. We needed it like we needed butter in our oatmeal. Maureen understood this and encouraged it. She'd settle into her chair, curling her feet under her in the tidy way a cat tucks its paws under its chest. To see Maureen was to see the great competency of being a mammal. She nourished herself against the elements. The Afghans in the big house were made by her, evidence of maternal instincts, the frailty of the body, the long hours of darkness in which there was nothing to do but spend time creating something that would give an illusion of the warmth of summer. It's God's own country, Maureen would say, and that made me jealous because I'd arrived at the same conclusion, except my conclusion was a series of wide-eyed thoughts that I'd never articulated co coherently only with words like, wow, and oh. Maureen said what I'd been feeling all along, a deep, solemn fear because the mountains were so steep, you were aware of the fact that they were nothing but the tops of bigger mountains growing out of the sea, because bears were not only ferocious, but real, because the water could kill you in 15 minutes, not by dashing your head, but by rocking you to hypothermic sleep, first cold and then warm. But I didn't have any way of explaining this immensity, either to myself or to other people. But Maureen could pluck at her afghan and look out at the land and say, it's God's country. Her tone never faltered. But instead of being the high gloss of practiced dining room chatter and jokes about beers that grew in creeks, it was reverent. 
It was the same statement, again and again, with all the guests. The Norwegians and the fishermen from Florida and the young Vermont family, because she found it unwaveringly true. By dinner time, the fog had deepened with the fading light. I moved in and out of the dining room, bringing in beer and bringing in bread. What do y'all want to do most when you're in Alaska? Asked Maureen. In fact, said the Norwegians, this is only our first stop of many. We go from Kodiak to Kenai and drive up to Denali. <laughs> The whole shebang, said Maureen, and then, when they didn't understand, she said, the whole tour. During the course of the meal, Maureen became less folksy, primer. She sat erect, talking about how she homeschooled her children right here on Lavender Island and taught them to live righteously. Stu's role was to be hearty, wild, a stubborn man at the end of the world with an appetite for flesh. He was getting red-faced and slapping the table, telling his stories about Kodiak in the bad old days. Scraped his face right up on the way out, and that gangway was painted for traction. There was so much sand in the paint that he looked like he'd been in a losing fight with a cat. The Norwegian sitting by Stu said, wow, and cracked another beer with evident relish. Twin boys, said Maureen. I was thinking about building a schoolhouse, but the winters here can be so harsh that I was worried about bears going in and trying to keep warm. But it's truly God's own country here. The Norwegian near her also said, wow, and ate another slice of buttery potato. And here's some Alaskan venison, I said, bringing in the platter. Cheers, chef, said Stu, wiping his face with his napkin. How do you say cheers in Norwegian? Skål. Skål, chef. Chef takes care of us so well, said Maureen. Chef's a real man of the West said Stu, an original cowboy. He's the real deal. Get in here, boss. Chef came in and stood near the table, full of fear of being presented to the heft of these healthy Norwegians. They ate a tremendous amount without breaking a sweat, would have to prepare a lot of mac and cheese. You have to tell us all tales of your wild past after dinner, said Stu to Chef. And Maureen said confidentially, to no one in particular, he's a blessing. Chef dipped his head in what seemed like part of a curtsy and then moved quickly back into the kitchen. I saw his dilemma. He knew he wasn't supposed to talk to the guests and yet he was being summoned. He stood rigidly by the stove and then tucked a piece of potato into his cheek. I think I'm gonna turn in, Chef said to me and walked out the door. The screen clattered and Stu roared from within the warm light of the dining room. Chef's the strong silent type. I watched Chef's spidery silhouette get swallowed up in the dim patch of the alders. I've often thought of Chef's fear of the Norwegians. Years later, I was hemmed in at a crowded bar in Beijing, making small talk with an EFL teacher who alternated between taking sips of his Tsingtao and clicking the rim of the bottle against his teeth in agitation. I was smiling, which is what I do when I'm agitated. I'm thinking, he said to me, about what happens when you go north from Beijing. You get to Inner Mongolia. And then he clicked. 
you get to Mongolia, Mongolia, but, and then, Russia? He was looking up at the ceiling. He was so drunk that he was looking up as if it were north. And then you keep going, he said. And apart from a few Siberian towns, there's nothing until you get to the North Pole. The fucking North Pole. Maybe Chef had some of this fear. The Norwegians came from further north even than Lavender Island. Norway was for the further north than anything imaginable. Thinking about the top of the globe was a bit like thinking about the size of outer space or all the kinds of deep sea fish still undiscovered or the bears that lived on Lavender Island. It was doubly unnerving in the same way that the bears were. One, because they lived somewhere inhospitable and two, because they thrived there. What I said to the drunk in Beijing was, it's God's own country up there. I said it slowly and solemnly, and he stopped singing, clicking his same towel against his teeth. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, where is Mira when she tells us her story? Uh, yeah, she is <coughs> teaching English as a foreign language. In, at that point, she is living in South Korea that has made a sort of career of it and sort of bouncing around from one post to the next. I'm asking this question up because I'm expecting you to tell us that, oh, I just spoke with her the other day and she's currently in New Zealand or whatever. Uh, but uh, to give you an idea that the story is actually told from a later point. So it is. She's, she's not in the moment, but she's looking back on yeah. the events that took place during that summer yeah. um, in Alaska. Yeah. From a distance of like 12, 13 years. 12, 12 yeah. 13 years. So at the time of this Alaskan adventure, she's a teenager who has dropped out of high school, and she's in the process of finding herself as a person. Um, that is, she is actively forming herself. She's, um, she's not just letting it happen. And I think the environment that she um, is in has this liberating effect because no one here knows her in Alaska. Yeah. Um, about herself, she says, uh, well, as far as anyone on Lavender Island was concerned, I had only ever existed here in my stripy pants. I was a nice girl from a nice home with little in the way of skills and a past that shapes everyone. Um, what drew you to the potential that lies in such liberation? It seemed, frankly, like what I was saying about the setting coming before everything else, it seems like an idea of self-mythologizing or, or, or like going out and trying to Grasp, grasp sort of like unbridled potential, the unbridled potential of being 18, the unbridled potential of going somewhere where no one knows you. This just seems like one of the reasons that people go to Alaska. Um, there's that and there's, as Isabel was talking about, like financial opportunity. Mm -hmm. And those two things are sort of fused in why this protagonist goes to, goes to Alaska. Um, to very much like live out what she sees as part of a, an Alaskan mythology. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know this mythology from, from, from other narratives of Alaska, we could um, mention the sort of sequel, prequel, Breaking Bad episode where Jesse um, ends up in Alaska, um, <coughs> Dave Eggers Europe of the New Frontier, something like that. There's a woman going to Alaska, T.C. Boyle, um, drop out city. Um, but one could say that it's not mm, really necessary for a person as young as Mira to go looking 
for a clean slate and, and a new start. And, and this is, I think, what makes the constellation so enticing, the, the exaggeration of it all. And, yeah. yeah. And is, is there something that drew you to this character, that um, sort of skillful exaggeration and for falling something really hard? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think <laughs> I wanted to... I wanted to, to sort of play with with a deluded character. I think a deluded character is tr a tremendous amount of fun. And I think that, um, that there, was, there was also something that I wanted to play against um, the idea of a, a young protagonist in a, in a Western because um, Alaska is a place that's besotted by its own um, by its own status as like a like an icon of the West, like the state motto was the last frontier. It lives within its its own place as that. I mean, I think that, that it's moved away, thankfully, from existing so much and being so dependent as. Um, like a like a like a tur a tourist icon of this like white American mythology, um, but I think because Alaska Alaska thinks of itself as such a Western place, I wanted to 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 look first and foremost at the kind of protagonists that um, that populate westerns, and there are a lot of young men that are going in search of ideals that have to do a lot with, with purity or finding, um, you know, finding themselves in, in untouched nature. And I wanted to create a, a protagonist that was very excited to go to Alaska, but not necessarily for the same reasons of like, check out this pristine glacier. Mm. Right. I think one we'll, in the second passage that you've chosen, we'll learn what she is searching for instead of pristine nature, or let's say in addition to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Shall we hear it? Yeah, of course. Um, without any further ado. I had been to the Kodiak Archipelago before. The previous year, I had been sent to spend the summer with my marvelous aunt. My aunt, when she explained where she lived, would make her hand into a map of Alaska, which I'm gonna attempt to do. You make a fist and then stretch your index fing finger and thumb out. It's Alaska. Your index finger becomes the Aleutian chain, fingertip west, stretching into the Bering Sea. And your thumb becomes the Alaskan panhandle, thumb tip south, stretching towards Vancouver. Where she lived was just below the second knuckle of the index finger on the island of Kodiak. I was sent to my aunt's cabin because it was thought that Alaska would correct me. My parents thought I was wayward because my grades were poor and even though I was a junior in high school, I still had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I had no drive. But I hadn't really dabbled in delinquency. I had never gotten it quite right. I bought the wrong hoodie, etc. So I was being sent away from the yellow Californian summer for being dissolute when I had only committed the crime of being interested in the dissolute. I was focused almost wholly on the subject of sleaze. What was sleazy? I didn't quite know, but I studied everything for traces of it. Sleaze had something to do with sex, something to do with danger, but it also had something to do with other 
more occluded aspects of adulthood. I couldn't define sleaze. I couldn't anticipate sleaze. But I could identify it. Places like dive bars exuded it, but it can also occur in sterile environments. Sometimes, even in Starbucks, there would be a man with a particular paunch that strained his shirt in a beguiling way, or a woman tottering in court heels. Then, even the cranberries in the scones would twinkle with sleeves. I knew sleaze had something to do with excess, and because of that, I wanted very, very much of it. I approached the subject with a taxonomist's dedication. I made lists of sleazy things, and things that other people thought were sleazy but weren't, like <clears throat> cold weather, as opposed to hot weather, was sleazy because the streets were empty and there was more privacy. Cleavage was sleazy, but breasts were not themselves necessarily sleazy. Big rigs were sleazy, but so were four-door sedans. I made these lists when I should have been studying. I failed French. I was lost in a complicated maze of my own fashioning, almost 17, still biting my nails down to nubbins as I cataloged. The word sleaze doesn't come up often when you're teaching English as a foreign language. I've only had students ask for its definition a few times, usually because someone on some forum has called someone else a sleaze bag or said, take it sleazy. When asked directly, I've made the elaborate shrug that communicates that I am not a dictionary, the definition can be looked up. But that's not exactly true. When I see students Googling, finding pictures of wide lapels and five o'clock shadow, I have the sensation of a drawstring being yanked closed. That's not all sleaze is. But I can't fully explain about sleaze. I can't write on the whiteboard. Fruit candy fed into female mouths and colored Christmas lights out of season are both sleazy. Sleaze can't exist without proximity to danger. People believe Florida is the sleaziest state, but they are wrong. It is Alaska. <laughs> so Mira, during the course of the novel, is working on a theory of sleaze. And you said that what initially brought you to engage with this concept, which, by the way, is not easy to translate into terms of speaking of writing between languages. I think it would, we would need more than one word to express sleaze or sleaziness in German. Or can you help me out here? Nice, nice. Dick says verderbtheit, but I don't quite buy that. Schlüpfrigkeit, <laughs> Schwierigkeit. There was a word in the 20s. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Verruchtheit. Um, yeah. All that um, and more. And you said what brought you to it or what drew you to it uh, originally was a contrarian impulse. Yeah. Could you perhaps tell I mean, us a bit more about this? This was, I mean, it definitely started with with thinking about this, this the the young the young man in Go West, young man in that like you know call to manifest destiny that gets regurgitated in a lot of westerns. There's this young guy and he's going out and he's searching for something pure and true, and that gets that gets very boring very quickly, right? Um, 
And I think it's also, you know, that, 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 that's an easy move is the fall to innocence. If what you want to do is like find an idea of like absolute purity. But I thought it was more interesting if there was someone who was out to find not something pure, but something, you know, sleazy, something murky, trying to find um, some sense in something that was sort of like sticky and corrupt. And then how, how do you evolve from from that? Like, how do you, how does, how does a search for something really compli complicated get even more complicated? And I was really, I, I wanted to like throw myself sort of an authorial curveball and be like, well, what, what, what would happen to someone who, who had that as their, as their like lodestar? So 